I'm not getting any response. All right, good morning. Well, apparently you can all hear me. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is um, Abdul Jinadu. Um, we have a fascinating panel this morning. Um, we're going to be discussing um, that. I am. <laughs> um, yes, we're going to be discussing this morning all things adjudication. Um, and we have a, a an esteemed panel this morning, some fantastic um, African lawyers. I can see just taking their place. Right. Um, can, I, um, can I see three panelists on there? Can you give me a thumbs up if, if we're ready to go? But I'm getting no sound from the venue. I think for those online, I think we're waiting for the panel to get themselves in place. All right. Good morning, everybody. Can 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 I get an indication from the panel? Anybody can hear me? Excellent. I've got a thumbs up. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Abdul Junardu. I'm a barrister at Keating Chambers. Um, I have been chosen to uh, chair this extremely august panel um, that's going to be discussing all things adjudication um, in Africa. Um, the panel was a very heavyweight panel. Um, we, we have um, starting from um, left to right on the panel, uh, we have Michelle Porter Wright, who is the director and counsel at Island Overy in Johannesburg. Uh, she focuses on um, contentious construction and um, risk advisory work. Um, she and, and she's a member of the broader dispute resolution team. Um, she has diverse experience in Africa and, and in South Africa in particular. Um, apparently, this is co. I don't know what's causing the echo. Am I good to get my good to carry on? Yes, thank you. Um, so I'll submit Michelle is um, has diverse experience of disputes in South Africa and and in the sub-Saharan region generally. She's dealt with a variety of construction projects, and she holds a master's in construction at law and dispute resolution from Kings in London. Then we have uh, next to Michelle Charles Charles Nirak, who is um, a extremely experienced um, African arbitrator. He is part African himself, he's Mauritian um, and French and British. He is a partner at Writing Case, um, international arbitration group based in Paris. He has uh, practiced um, across many jurisdictions, um, focusing on construction and energy disputes. Um, he also teaches at Sciences Po. And interesting fact, Charles lived in Lagos as a child and is a regular visitor to Nigeria. 
Um, from what I can see, um, on I think I've got David next to Charles. David Kagawa is a senior partner at um, Kagawa and Kagawa Associates, a specialist law firm in Kampala, Uganda. He has a strong arbitral practice, both as counsel and as arbitrator. Um, he has um, rendered a number of um, arbitral decisions which have been enforced in the courts and his practice focuses on uh, major infrastructure, construction, projects, energy, and um, general commercial transactions. And last, but certainly by no means least, is Dr. Wilf Makuba, who is the chair of the Kenya branch of the Charter Institute of Arbitrators, which has over 2,000 members. Um, he has been recognized as one of the top 50 leading arbitrators in Africa, and he teaches arbitration across the globe and locally at the Kenyan School of Law. So that's your panel. Um, I'd like to thank them all for, for turning up to be in Lagos. Unfortunately, I, I couldn't be in Lagos for um, professional reasons. I had professional commitments, which, which means I have to be in London, unfortunately. Um, but we're going to discuss um, adjudication this morning. And adjudication, um, certainly in this part of the world, in the UK, now has a very long and established history. Um, adjudication was, uh, became part of UK law in 1996 and has been, and before that there were um, non statutory adjudications, but it really took off in 1996. So we've had almost you know, 25, 25 years worth of um, experience with adjudication in this part of the world. Um, adjudication has been implemented by statute in other parts of the, of the globe. So um, various jurisdictions in Australia, um, in Malaysia. Um, and it's interesting to see how those jurisdictions have developed um, adjudication. What we do not have yet, unfortunately, in my view, is any African jurisdiction which has uh, taken up the practice of what we've instituted um, adjudication um, as a matter of statute. Um, we have some evidence of um, practice of, adjudic of, of, of adjudication, primarily um, in the context of um, the dispute boards, which are required by various um, standard form contracts, particularly FIDIC comes to mind, um, which um, has provision for dispute boards. And I know that in South Africa, there's a very strong non-statutory um, adjudication um, community and practice. Um, and I know that other jurisdictions in Africa have flirted with um, en enacting um, adjudication, but none have yet taken that, that, that final step. Even in South Africa, um, the prompt payment regulations, which, which were um, proposed um, a few years ago, have unfortunately not been carried into law. So what we're going to be exploring this, this morning in, the, in, in this session, and it's going to be by way of a conversation rather than anything else, will be the general background to, to adjudication and what it means in the African context and what, what we can do in Africa, but what, look at it critically and, and, and look at whether or not it brings any advantages to the construction industry in Africa and what we can do if to, to try and implement adjudication in, um, in Africa. So if um, I could call on Charles, just give us a, a brief sort of 10 minute summary of a sort of an introduction to adjudication because i know that maybe members of the audience were not familiar with with the process so charles can i ask you to give you give us 10 minutes a sort of adjudication 101 thank you abdul i'm just taking my watch off to make sure that i can keep my my eye on the time and members in the audience don't don't hesitate to start uh, waving at me if i go over time but i'll i'll try not to so thank you very much abdul for that introduction uh, I am going to be giving some general uh, uh, background to adjudication. As Abdul mentioned, uh, uh, adjudication can be divided in the statutory adjudication that's available in some jurisdictions, uh, uh, not that many at the end of the day. Um, I'm not that familiar with the statutory adjudication, and we will be talking about that uh, in more detail later uh, today. So I'm, I'm going to focus on adjudication as it is practiced uh, uh, internationally 
outside of the specific jurisdictions that have a statutory regime. And the, the, the practice of adjudication really takes the form of dispute boards, and they come in different shapes and forms, and I'll, I'll say a few words about that. But the important starting point, of course, is that in that international practice, dispute boards are a creature of contract. So at the end of the day, one can say so many things about dispute boards, but where the truth is to be found is in every contract creating a dispute board. And I've had cases, for example, where someone says, oh, the contract is based on FIDIC. It's a FIDIC dispute board. Okay, great, fine. And then you read the contract and you realize that, you know, a few changes were made here and there. And those small changes that sometimes aren't even visible. You know, sometimes the changes are made in the particular conditions. So you'll have the general conditions are untouched and the particular conditions will clearly identify what has changed. Well, that's great. But sometimes, and it's quite legitimate, parties will go and lift a clause from, let's say, a FIDIC contract or another contract and then, you know, change it as they wish. And then obviously you need to read very, very carefully to make sure, okay, how is this contract different from the contracts I'm accustomed to? So creature of contract is really the first, uh, the first point. But talking in generalities, what do most contracts in international practice do when it comes to creating uh, an adjudication regime in the form of a dispute board? Well, typically, a dispute board is one or three persons. They're usually engineers, uh, uh, and I personally think that's a good thing, uh, uh, although it's quite possible to have other profiles also. And I think that the legal profession maybe would love to see more lawyers in those dispute boards, but I'm not sure that's necessarily a good thing. We can discuss that uh, further also. Um, the dispute boards are either standing or ad hoc. Standing means that they are put in place from the outset of the contract, and they will usually visit the site from time to time, say every three months, to follow the works, see what's happening. And that allows the dispute board to have not only the, uh, uh, the, 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 the adjudication cap, but also the dispute avoidance cap. They, by visiting the site regularly, by asking questions, by, by flushing out the issues, they can force the parties to put issues on the table, resolve them, and thus avoid them uh, 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 becoming a, a dispute. Uh, so standing DAB, is, sorry, the dispute board is one possibility. Another one is an ad hoc dispute board that's put in place specially to resolve any uh, given dispute. The members of the dispute board are typically independent uh, from the parties, but more often than not, they will be approved by uh, uh, both parties. The time frame is typically extremely short. Under the FIDIC contract, for example, it's 84 days. Uh, the ICC uh, has put out some rules uh, for dispute boards and they provide for 90 days. So extremely short time frame, which raises its own, uh, uh, its own issues since parties will often be tempted to extend those timelines. And before you know, the quick and dirty dispute board can turn into a mini arbitration, if not a full-blown arbitration. I think it's useful to go back to maybe the DNA of dispute boards for, 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 for a minute, just to, to understand where they come from. And where it started was in the United States in uh, uh, the 1970s, as far as I know, and if anyone knows better, please correct me, but the very first uh, uh, dispute board was a dispute review board that was used in 1975 for a tunnel project, the Eisenhower project in the United States. And that US practice was then extended to US-led uh, international projects in the 1980s. One saw uh, dispute boards, dispute review boards uh, uh, in, uh, in Latin America. And big event in 1995, the World Bank decided to make dispute review boards mandatory for all their, their projects. And other multilateral bank, banks then followed suit. And uh, a next big event in 2004, the ICC put out a set of rules that provided for different configuration of dispute boards. What I'm talking about here is dispute review boards. Dispute review boards is usually the label associated with a board that does not issue a decision, but issues a recommendation 
that the parties are free to follow or not to follow, of course, because all it is is a recommendation. And that's how dispute boards started. It's consulting a board in order to get a recommendation on how to resolve a dispute. Um, that model has uh, largely given way to a different model, which is the model whereby the board actually issues a decision, which is usually described as a dispute board. Although, let's remember, creature of contract, right? So if you, your contract can perfectly well call the board a dispute review board, and yet provide for the dispute review board to issue a decision. So those labels uh, are useful labels. They do correspond to general practice, but let's beware. It's not because the, you know, a certain label is used that it means certain things you need to go and read the contract. The dis dispute adjudication boards, uh, uh, the, I think the birthplace was on the Channel Tunnel project, but there again, so that was in the mid 1980s, uh, used very successfully in order to resolve disputes. In that case, it was an interesting setup. It was a huge project, of course, and there was one uh, chair, one individual who was a lawyer, by the way, a law professor, uh, was the chair of the dispute board. And then that chair had a whole pool of individuals at his disposal that he could pick from in order to constitute the right board for the right dispute. So in that pool of individuals, pre-identified individuals, there were engineers, there were also lawyers, I think there were accountants, so different profiles that could be drawn from uh, 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 in each case for the, for, the, for the appropriate dispute. And that's that dispute adjudication model is the model that was adopted by FIDIC in 1999, and that probably is what explains why the adjudication versus the review board model has really uh, 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 now dominates the, the, the scene. And the World Bank, I mentioned earlier that the World Bank had initially uh, used the dispute review board model. In 2005, they switched to the adjudication uh, uh, model, and that's what they impose now in all their, their, their projects. I think my 10 minutes are probably up, and I, I think I've covered the, uh, uh, all the key points and the key trends. But one important point I want to make is that the decisions issued by a dispute adjudication board are typically subject to the terms of the contract, of course, binding. They will be binding. And if one takes uh, uh, the FIDIC contracts, for example, it's possible for the losing party to issue a notice of dissatisfaction. But even if it does, that decision remains binding. In other words, the losing party has to comply with it. It can then go to arbitration or whatever the contract provides for as the final step of dispute resolution, but the decision should be honored, should be enforced, because uh, that's the undertaking set forth in the, in the contract. And I think that's one of the frontiers where uh, the situation is still, I would say, not clear enough. In my practice, that's the difficulty I see. You know, dispute boards will issue a decision, and yet one needs to go to arbitration and wait for the arbitration award for the decision to be actually honored by the losing party, which I think is a, um, is a big problem. Quick word of conclusion is, are these dispute boards successful? And I'm, I'm looking here at a, a slide that I've excerpted. It's a presentation from the Dispute Resolution Board Foundation. Now, granted, the Dispute Resolution Board Foundation has a vested interest in promoting dispute boards. So it's no surprise that they will tell us that dispute boards are highly successful. Uh, but they have uh, gathered some stats. This is a presentation from 2018. So pre-pandemic, I'm not sure uh, there is a more updated one. But at the time, they had surveyed among their members uh, dispute board decisions. And out of 512 dispute board, dis dispute board decisions, only 32 were referred to arbitration. And out of those 32, only seven were overturned in the process. So if these figures are accurate, and I have no reason to, to doubt them, it does demonstrate that dispute boards really do work. And with apologies for going a couple minutes over time, uh, that's my introduction, uh, Abdul. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much, Charles. That was very useful. Um, can we turn to uh, Wilfred, please? Wilfred, going to talk to us uh, for a few minutes about 
ad hoc versus standing adjudication panels. I think Charles touched on this um, um, in, in the introduction, but if we can have Wilfred just talk to us about the the differences, the advantages versus disadvantages of having a standing dispute board versus uh, an ad hoc dispute board. Over to you, Wilfred. Um, and thank you for the invitation. I, I want to say uh, this um, in terms of the context of the African practitioner and where I come from. As a practitioner and as a default appointing authority, one of the, and, and, and um, my colleague has laid the basis quite well, one of the challenges you get with the adjudication generally is um, at the transactional end and even at the um, advisory end at the end as you advise clients on where to go to to resolve their disputes. The viability of adjudication becomes an issue particularly within our practices uh, because of several challenges and one of the biggest challenge is the nature of adjudication itself. The way adjudication is practiced on the continent and particularly in Kenya and East Africa. The lack of legislation the lack of legislation largely proceeding on adjudication on the basis of agreement of parties and many times on ad hoc uh, adjudication basis. The second challenge, and, and I say this advisedly because when you have a client and you talk to them about adjudication and you have to explain that perhaps the outcome is unlikely to be honored until another process is undertaken, you, you begin to see difficulties, particularly when parties or counterparties take the adjudication process as a dress rehearsal for arbitration. It's just a formality. We are going there, take the 90 days, uh, try what we can, and simply decline to accept the process without even particularly having a reason for doing so. You also have a very big challenge when you look at adjudication uh, practiced on the continent, particularly uh, outside the formal structure, when you have very few experts, and I want to say this, we have very many subject matter experts, factual experts, fact people who come to speak about the dispute in subject matter, but we have very few expert witnesses in adjudication. People who have uh, participated in expert testimony or expert evidence uh, before uh, adjudication panels. You, you will get the uh, cost consultant, you'll get engineers who are able to speak about their subject matter properly, but who have very little experience in terms of presenting a persuasive case before uh, an adjudication board, uh, a DAB or an adjudicator. The other challenge you actually find uh, with the um, the form of structure we deal with mostly, and this is a very common practice where I come from, I don't know about others, is this creeping approximation with arbitration. The In a typical adjudication, if you went before an adjudicator this morning without knowing that this is an adjudication process, you are likely to imagine that you're before an arbitration panel. You are likely to think that you are before arbitrators because everything that happens in an arbitration now typically happens in adjudication. It's supposed to be an in situ dispute resolution mechanism. You are supposed to largely look at documents and see the process end in 28, 58, 80, 90 days. But what happens is that you have a fully fledged trial with witnesses being cross-examined. And I, I have analyzed this because I have sat as an adjudicator. I have also sat as a party representative and what happens is this conduct uh, arises from adjudicators who are typically arbitrators also sitting as adjudicators. So the, the, the distinction is not very clear in the way they practice. And they carry on what they know into the, into the adjudication uh, panel. Again, the lawyers who practice typically before arbitrators are the very same ones who bring the conduct, the character, the practices, just the way arbitration was infiltrated by court practice, practices, is what is happening in adjudication. 
So it becomes increasingly difficult for you to draw a distinction between what happens before adjudication um, uh, boards and, and what happens before arbitrators and even court. All these places have a similarity, the documentation, the manner of objections, the requests which are made for production, inspection of documents, find their way in all these processes. So it becomes very blurry for you to understand what exactly happens in these processes. Again, where I come from, one of the challenges you find is uh, the availability of multiple fora. Now, um, if, you, if you practice law on the side of the continent we come from, when you have a multi-party uh, contract that is complex, such as infrastructure complex contracts and construction contracts, you are likely to have very many facets of disputes. There may be an environmental angle, there is a procurement angle, there is an angle that deals with licensing and other things. Eventually, you have a party or parties who have an opportunity to approach six or seven tribunals specially created by statute to resolve small disputes within a whole dispute. So that you have a dispute going on on the licensing end, on the procurement end, and even on the constitutional court end. And a very creative dispute resolving, uh, people who want to stall the process will approach courts and uh, try to challenge some of the elements of the contract. You just heard this morning about local content. The very fact that you have a dispute on a project does not exclude the possibility that an aggrieved party would still find way in court to try and restrain uh, this uh, dispute adjudication board or the adjudicator or even arbitrator from hearing and determining a dispute because there are constitutional elements which have to be dealt with in public law for us such as courts. So what you find is that many times you are faced with a situation where you have even judges of courts who do not understand this process, who do not understand that there could be a, a contractual process that could render decisions on matters between parties and you find yourself served with a court order stopping you from further proceedings, notwithstanding the fact that you have 90 days to determine the dispute. So there are very many problems that attend. But the good news is this. Well, from where I sit as the chairman of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Kenya branch, this is the premier body in terms of appointment of neutrals in the country. Our statistics seem to show that despite all these difficulties, adjudication is increasingly becoming popular, particularly in large infrastructure con contracts that involve government entities particularly. The National Highways Authority in Kenya, for instance, maintains a panel of adjudicators, a panel of adjudicators whom we supply every year to them. Unfortunately, unfortunately, many of the people who pursue this line are engineers because of their line of their business. Civil, civil, civil engineers, I see a lot of that. Very few lawyers are actually properly grounded in this area. And many times when I am asked to give a lawyer who has 20 years experience in this area, five lawyers, I am not able to get three from my panel. But I say this uh, because I, I have seen the growth of adjudication uh, in this sense. 10, 15 years ago, we hardly had two or three appointments happening in a year. Today, I would say this year alone, I have made over 20 appointments of adjudicators this year alone, and we are not yet halfway. So the, 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 standing, uh, the standing adjudication boards and the, the, the ad hoc, uh, I, I receive requests, but usually very stringent qualifications are required. And therefore, one of the challenges we have is a challenge of having the capacity or the relevant competency. The other thing is um, I see a significant growth in terms of, um, and, and one of the things I want to share with what uh, my colleague has said is, we hardly see enforcement in courts of adjudication decisions. There is something about the adjudication process that gives confidence in the parties to the extent that I have not seen a single adjudication decision that has had to go for enforcement in arbitration or courts so far. 
So I think it is one of the things that come with the territory and perhaps the understanding of the process. What are we doing as an institute to build uh, capacity, competence, and maybe even uh, push uh, adjudication forward? The first thing we do, we have noticed that the most popular adjudication clauses uh, or contracts are the standard forms in the FIDIC contracts. So very popular even with Kenyan government uh, entities. Uh, but even more importantly, I have seen the uh, Kenyan government standard form contract which has a specific adjudication clause and names the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators as a source of these adjudicators. So what are we doing? We, we are holding trainings together with government entities, organizations, particularly those in the construction field, the Kenya Rural, Rural Roads Authority, the Kenya Highways Authority, uh, the National Construction Authority. So we have specialized courses uh, in terms of adjudication because the Chartered Institute has that qualification, a pathway right from module one to the fellowship level of adjudication. We also want to hold master classes, particularly for lawyers so, who... Sorry, 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 Wilfred. Sorry, Wilfred, I'm sorry to um, cut you off. Sorry. Uh, resolution. Wait. Hello. We, we have a critical Hello. mass of people who can this dispute resolution area. We have also developed adjudication rules. We have adjudication rules which have been in force or in use for the last 10 years. But we are spearheading discussions with the Office of the Attorney General uh, to, to, to prepare ourselves to launch or to move to, to Parliament and seek to have a statute uh, that regulates adjudication, uh, a standalone statute that deals with adjudication. Those, those are some of the areas we are focused our attention on. Hi, but, hello, uh, hello. Short. The adjudication as, as a mode of dispute resolution for construction disputes gives one advantage. The expert element in the dispute resolution is what everybody is looking for in adjudication. Time and the expertise. Those two elements are the most important. I think legislating may not necessarily improve the prospects of adjudication, particularly in Kenya or East Africa, what is likely to improve the prospects of adjudication is the ready availability of people who understand adjudication right from the transaction itself, the preparation of the contracts, to the very end of dispute resolution. The gap exists at those two extremes because many of the people who prepare these contracts, as I said, do a cut and paste job. Many times you will find them making reference to uh, three or Hello. three panels, a panel of three people to deal with disputes, small disputes regarding the repair of waterworks in certain places in the rural areas. Uh, $3,000, $4,000 contract. Sometimes I meet a complex uh, adjudication or dispute resolution clause that requires me to appoint three adjudicators of very long experience to resolve a dispute that is hardly a million dollars, sometimes even hardly a thousand dollars. So I think the, the gaps exist at both ends of the spectrum, uh, but uh, I think the, 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 the statistics as we see them on the ground are very positive in terms of the reception uh, by government, particularly uh, in this area. Thank you very much. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much, Wolf. But um, a, little, a little bit over time, but I, I think that for all for once. Um, yes, well, we now move on, please, to Michelle, who is going to speak to us about um, the difference between binding decisions versus recommendations. Um, thanks, Abdul. <laughs> Can you hear me? I can hear you. No, I can't now. Oh. 
I'd like to share some, um, some comments um, relative to the use of dispute boards um, in the Southern African context. Um, as Abdul uh, rightly pointed out, um, South Africans have some great experience uh, in dispute boards, um, mainly given two distressed, fiddick procured power stations, um, which have, have given South African lawyers and litigators over the last 10 to 12 years uh, a crash course in dispute boards, uh, perhaps a crash course in how dispute boards ought not to be run. Um, so to state the obvious, Dispute boards are creatures of contract. Uh, that's certainly the case in South Africa. We haven't yet adopted a statutory adjudication framework. Um, the market are still heavy users of the FIDIC 99 forms of contract. So that's the standing and the ad hoc uh, DABs. And I might just caveat upfront that the experience um, is highly variable, both from project to project, uh, and even relative to sort of two disputes on, on the same project. Uh, you might have quite different experiences in how uh, dispute adjudication boards or uh, adjudication is deployed. So the first point which has already been touched on, uh, and also I'll just fly through my observations, is the relative length and complexity of proceedings in a Southern African context. Um, and it's a particular bugbear of claims practitioners and legal, practic uh, legal practitioners in the, in the area. Um, DABs often sort of devolve into litigation in a boardroom, uh, which has already been touched on. The 84-day period is, is often waived. Um, and the reason we have this extremely adversarial format of dispute board is because generally the lawyers involved, the adjudicators, the DAB uh, panel members are seasoned commercial high court litigators. Um, and they're used to litigating uh, under the South African high court rules, which are a notoriously uh, adversarial, technical adversarial set of, of high court rules. And so this process descends into this very sort of uh, technical adversarial warfare um, and uh, we've had DOBs protract as long as 18 months from referral to decision. Um, and perhaps my favorite war story from a DAB, which in all fairness was 10 to 12 years ago now, we once um, spent an entire day arguing an interlocutory, an application to strike out following filing of a referral, um, which uh, is uh, uh, quite ridiculous. Um, and... Um, yeah, so um, I think the market is evolving. We have seen DABs run on a more sensible, inquisitorial uh, sort of format. Um, but uh, hopefully, uh, once statutory adjudication uh, is engaged in our jurisdiction, um, the lawyers will reinvent their procedural habits. Um, so we find um, with dispute boards, um, they tend to work really well um, for sort of narrow, in-principle disputes, those of sort of a contractual nature, <clears throat> where you've got sort of large disputes, uh, chunky issues of time and quantum and particularly disruption. Um, <clears throat> they tend to, uh, to be quite ineffective and uh, sort of descended to a little bit of a lottery, really. Um, I think in our market in particular, just sort of a practice observation is that um, good relationships with your opposing attorney really do go a long way um, in, in terms of serving your client in this process. Um, you know, we've managed to bifurcate decisions on merits and quantum, for example, where it's made sort of commercial sense to do so. Um, and we've also managed to convert particularly contentious, um, you know, difficult DABs into arbitrations by agreement with the other side. Um, so that's worked quite well if you can secure agreement. I think a practical issue we've come across with DABs um, is conflicts and allegations of bias, particularly in a smaller market. Um, we've had, you know, the other side accusing a project adjudicator of bias, digging their feet in and refusing to engage in proceedings. Um, <clears throat> and you have to weigh up a course of action in those circumstances, but I mean, often it, it, uh, it's the most sensible and practical just to replace the adjudicator and, and, and continue. Um, 
We've seen in a number of a number of employers, particularly in the mining sector and um, in um, and, and some government sectors, municipalities in particular, writing out the binding nature of um, adjudication decisions. Um, we've seen uh, recently um, an NEC contract sort of amended uh, just to, to take its teeth out, um, and that sort of is a bit of a pattern that repeats itself uh, in those sectors. Um, we're also seeing parties um, agree the names of project adjudicators or um, DAB panels up front, or at least agreeing a shortlist. Um, that tends to work really well, and we encourage it because um, it avoids all sorts of appointment disputes later on, potentially. Um, and um, I think it's fair to say, on balance, that um, our market doesn't quite use this sort of um, dispute avoidance component of um, DABs uh, all that well. They sort of tend to perform a, uh, exclusively an adjudication function where we see them. And then just quickly touching on rules, um, the Arbitration Foundation of Southern Africa, um, I understand, has a project underway um, drafting some dispute board rules, so um, those will be the first in our region. Um, those um, uh, we hope will be um, successfully adopted in the region. And then I understand that the Cairo Regional Centre, um, during the course of last year, published two sets of dispute board rules. Uh, one uh, dispute review board uh, set of rules and another dispute adjudication board set of rules. Um, and I also understand that, um, that the centre is administering adjudications, which is a really novel uh, and uh, exciting, I suppose, a, a, a space to watch. Uh, those are my observations. Thanks. Thanks, Abdul. Thanks, Michelle. Um, we're fast running out of time, so I'm going to reshuffle um, topics a little bit. Can we uh, hear now from David um, on the challenges of enforcement in, in adjudication? Um, adjudication was to ensure that the much needed cash flow continues to flow in construction projects. That was the rationale why adjudication was introduced in construction contracts. But now we are faced with issues of challenges in the same process that was meant to take away the cash flow challenges. So you realize that once a dispute adjudication board has made a decision, um, the losing party must respect it because it's binding. Um, it's based on the principle that you must pay now and adjudicate later, maybe before an arbitration panel. But many a time, employers do not pay because they think that maybe the arbitration panel will overturn the, the decision of the dispute adjudication board. So uh, in the part of Africa where I come from, in Uganda, East Africa, we do not have a legislation, just like Dr. Mutua said. So the absence of legislation creates uh, creativity among us lawyers on how to go about some of these adjudication decisions. So one of the ways in which adjudication decisions are enforced, of course not without a problem, is by filing a summary suit in the court. So you have uh, an adjudication decision saying you should get maybe $100,000, so you have to file a summary suit before the ordinary court, and then you have to wait for the judge to give you a debt. So it defeats the purpose why adjudication was introduced. You need to line up because the courts are busy. And then, because arbitration comes after adjudication, and the intention was that the choice of arbitration is to ensure confidentiality between the parties, the court opens up everything. Because then the judge will have to see the certificates that were issued and all sorts of proceedings that had been commenced. So the one challenge is the fact that you have to line up in the court process to make sure that you get summary judgment, which is not usually um, obvious because the other party then files an application for leave to appear and defend. And it's very easy to spend a whole year just trying to enforce an adjudication decision. The other way in which uh, adjudication decisions are enforced is 
the successful party can issue a statutory notice. A statutory notice is usually used in insolvency proceedings. It is a very disruptive method where, uh, for example, a contractor issues a statutory notice against their employer. In essence, they're trying to tell the employer that you are unable to pay your debts and you're fit to be wound up. It's very disruptive, but in certain jurisdictions, it puts pressure on the employer to effect the payment, but it definitely affects the relationship going forward. Um, but many a time it doesn't succeed, most especially if um, the employer has issued a notice of dissatisfaction, and maybe if the employer is claiming that they're entitled to um, a set off uh, for one reason or another, maybe due to delay um, or any other reason. Now, the other challenge is um, a big number of contracts in Uganda which are above $10 million and which are World Bank funded. Um, they insist that it is the FIDIC contract that has to be complied with, that has to be used um, to govern the relationship. Now, under the FIDIC contract, arbitration, uh, you can only go to arbitration after adjudication. And the decision of the dispute adjudication board, though binding, is not final. So in essence, even if the losing party does not issue a notice of dissatisfaction, you have to commence arbitration in order to recover the money. Now the challenge is, the fact that there is no notice of dissatisfaction, you would think that there is no dispute, because then what is the arbitrator going to decide? Now, what is the dispute at this stage is the failure to pay. So now you have to set up the arbitral panel to simply make a finding that failure by one party to comply with the dispute adjudication board's decision amounted to a breach of contract. Yet all of you know it's a breach of contract, but you have to go through that process to get the arbitration panel make that decision because then it is only the decision of the arbitrator that will be final and enforceable before the court. The other method of uh, enforcement is um, through um, a mandatory injunction. Like I've told you, where there is no legislation, uh, lawyers become creative. So proceedings are filed where you seek a mandatory injunction against uh, maybe the accounting officer of a ministry, compelling them to effect a certain payment um, within a certain period of time. Many a time, the judges will issue the, inju the, the mandatory injunction, uh, ordering them to make the payment. Now, challenges come where the accounting officer does not comply with the order of the court. Then you have to take out contempt of court proceedings, which sometimes involve fines uh, or sending someone to jail. So you realize that the ultimate relationship between the employer and contractor uh, gets derailed during this whole process. Of course, the other, other part, aspect of uh, enforcement is uh, if the contract is governed by the fitting conditions of contract, um, not, failure to comply with the dispute adjudication board's decision is a ground for termination because it becomes an issue of non-payment. So a notice of termination can be issued. And uh, of course, once that is issued, uh, the it's most likely that the employer will come to a negotiation table and uh, payments may be eff effected. So just like uh, Dr. Mutuba said, in the absence of a legislation, uh, we're still faced with challenges of enforcing uh, adjudication decisions. Uh, thank you, Abdul. Excellent, thank you very much, David. We are are running out of time and we have some questions that have been posted online and I hope there's some questions in the room and I'd like to get to those before we conclude but before we do that um, I'm supposed to speak for five minutes or so on um, the benefits of statutory adjudication um, I speak um, I think I'm the only person on the panel who um, practices the jurisdiction that's got statutory adjudication but also because of my international practice um, I do a lot of dispute work, um, dispute board work, dispute adjudication board work uh, in Africa and around the world. So I, I, I'm fortunate enough to be 
in a position where I've got experience of both systems. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in the UK, um, the government brought in um, statutory adjudication in a piece of legislation that came in in 1996. Um, the actual provisions didn't come into force until 1999. Before the legislation in 96, um, there had been, adjudication had been a, a contractual mechanism adopted um, varying degrees of popularity within the UK construction industry. But when it was brought in about a statute, it meant that all, qualif all qualifying contracts had to have um, provisions for adjudication. And if they didn't, the law would imply those terms into the, into the contract. What that meant was that um, there was legislative backing for the enforceability of decisions of adjudicators. That then had the result that the courts had to develop a whole new jurisprudence and a whole new procedure for um, enforcing decisions of adjudicators. Um, we're fortunate enough in the UK to have a specialist construction court, the TCC, the Technology and Construction Court, who, who, who deals with all construction related matters, pretty much. And there you have specialist judges who do this sort of work day in, day out. And the TCC has developed a very detailed procedure for enforcing decisions of adjudicators. Um, and that, that procedure and practice has grown and developed over the last 20 plus years that we've had um, special adjudication. The, the net effect of that is that if you get a decision of an adjudicator, you ought, and, and, and for whatever reason, it's not been honored, been, not been honored by the losing party, you will be able to get in front of a judge within sort of six to eight weeks to get your decision enforced. And the enforcement procedure is by way of summary judgment in most cases. There are a few exceptions, but, but by and large, is, it's summary judgment, part 24 summary judgment. And what you end up with, if you're successful in front of the courts, is an order of the court that the loser has to pay. And if he doesn't, then he's subject to all the, all the sanctions that he would be, he would be, he would be um, subject to um, in, in, in relation to any other order of the court. Um, in the early days, um, David made, made mention of uh, attempting to use what we call here statutory demands to try and get enforcement. The statutory demand is an, a notice you issue to a debtor saying, pay me, otherwise I'll try and wind you up. Um, that practice has largely fallen out of favour because of the well-developed um, process we now have on the TCC for forcing decisions. So um, you're likely to get in front of a judge within six to eight weeks. Of, of, of filing an application for enforcement. Um, and the courts have made it very clear, it's in, it's in decisions, some of which I, I appeared in, um, going all the way up to the Court of Appeal, where um, they've made it very clear that the basis on which you can challenge the decision of an adjudicator are very, very narrow. Um, you know, in the old days, and in, in the early days of adjudication, lawyers, uh, being the creative uh, minds that we are, were trying to find all sorts of different means of, um, of, of, of of challenging decisions. And the courts have, over the years, gradually narrowed those opportunities to leave a very, very limited number of options for you to try and um, resist enforcement. Um, there are various mechanisms for dealing with um, potentially insolvent um, claimants, um, uh, people applying for stays of, 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 of stays of judgment, um, to try and avoid insolvency, but so there, there, there are lots of cases going up to, to the Supreme Court now dealing with uh, the impact of insolvency on adjudication. So what we have in the UK is a very developed ecosystem for enforcing um, decisions, decisions of, of adjudicators. Um, it, that is replicated to, to varying degrees in other jurisdictions that have such adjudication. So as I said, as mentioned earlier, Australia, the various jurisdictions in Australia that have um, statutory adjudication. But adjudication, but in, in Australia, it's it, it primarily focused on prompt payment, whereas in the UK, you can adjudicate about anything. There are no restrictions on what you can adjudicate about. Um, so Australia, uh, Malaysia, these are jurisdictions that, that have statutory adjudication. New Zealand as well, uh, statutory adjudication. So they, they, they all have different um, mechanisms for enforcement, but they're all pretty much the same 
along the same lines. It follows the, the, the same, the same, the same rationale, which is get in front of a judge as quickly as you can, as, as you can and have a summary process to have enforcement. Now, in jurisdictions where you do not have that kind of statutory backing, there are difficulties, as David outlined, I think, and, and I think, and Michelle touched on. If you don't have the statutory backing, then you are having to come up with different mechanisms to try and achieve that purpose. The problem is, without the statutory backing, you end up being clogged, clogged down in the same judicial processes that apply to all other sort of all other cases. And as education is meant to be a quick, dirty resolution of a dispute, you know, pay now, argue later. If you're stuck in a court trying to enforce two, three, four, five years down the road, then it, it utterly defeats the purpose. So um, while there's an increasing popularity of adjudication across the continent, the difficulty is that um, once you get your decision, you very often find yourself back in the, you know, the old um, civil courts trying to get enforcement uh, with all the issues that that, that, that that gives rise to. Um, what I've seen proposed a number of contracts is to have some sort of alternative mechanism for enforcement. So, for instance, having a bond as callable on the presentation of a favorable decision of an adjudicator. That way, um, you can get your money quickly without having to go through the um, processes that are attendant on going to court. So I think if Africa is going to really embrace adjudication, I think you either have to have um, more legislation, and I'm glad to hear that Kenya is looking at this, uh, more jurisdictions are taking up um, statutory backing for adjudication and providing for a fast track process that avoids all the, all, you know, all the challenges that we're used to in relation to arbitral, arbitral, arbitral decisions, you know, people, people arguing constitutional rights to, 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 to have their matter heard in court, people arguing about natural justice, all the sorts of um, challenges can be avoided if you have properly drafted, properly implemented statutory um, provisions. In the absence of that, if we don't get that, and I, I hope we do across more jurisdictions, I think lawyers have to become more creative about how they can um, weave into the contract contractual mechanisms that can that can ensure um, that we end up in a, in, a, in a position where we have um, swift enforcement of decisions of, of, of adjudicators. Um, I, as I said, I think we've got questions that I think we, I'd like us to get to before um, we close out. Um, can I please start with one that's been put in the chat? Um, yes, please explain the difference between the, the DAB as per FIDIC and the adjudication as per UK law. And which is most cost effective and efficient. Um, anybody on the panel want to take that one up? Any volunteers? All right, well, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll volunteer then because I've, uh, as I said, I'm, 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 I, I, I'm, I'm, I practice in the UK system and I practice internationally as well. I, I think the differences between the two, I mean, there, there, there are a number of differences. One is in terms of you know, the time scales. Um, under FIDIC, FIDIC is generally 84 days to make a decision. Under UK, under UK um, um, statutory adjudication, you have to render a decision within 28 days, subject to uh, the parties agreeing to various extensions of time. But the default position is 28 days. I mean, that, that's the first and obvious major difference. The other major difference um, between DABs under FIDIC and um, uh, under UK law, and again, I just mentioned that there are, I've, I've come across instances where uh, FIDIC contracts have been used in the UK, but they've had to be adapted to comply with UK law. So the 28 day provision had to be written in. Um, the standard DAB provision in, 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 in FIDIC is with a three member uh, DAB panel. In the UK, the general position is to have a single adjudicator. Uh, FIDIC provides for uh, standing boards um, the UK law does, doesn't require standing any kind of standing education provision. It does, um, the parties are free to nominate um, adjudicators in their contract or, to, or more usually they will nominate a, a nominating body who will make the appointment. Um, in terms of what's more cost efficient, cost effective and efficient, um, if you're defining, defining efficiency by speed of decision, then the UK uh, 
legislation is more efficient because it get, generally gets you to, to a decision within, within 28 days or there thereabouts. Um, I sit as an adjudicator and I find that um, very often parties will extend the, 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 the 28 days, but rarely does it go up to anything approaching 84 days. So it's usually quicker than under FIDIC. Um, which is more cost effective? Again, I would say cost effectiveness, because you have a single member, um, single adjudicator in the under UK legislation, UK legislation is generally cheaper, in my experience, than than, than what you generally have under um, under FIDIC contracts. And also, you rem without the international element of it, which you have you know, um, with FIDIC, where um, you have adjudicators based in different jurisdictions, how it, you know, in the old days before, before the pandemic, having to fly in um, to one central location to have a, a hearing, etc. Um, generally, the UK um, is, 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 is quicker and it's cheaper. And that, that, that's my experience. Um, any views from the panel? Okay. Um, can, we haven't, are there any questions from the, from the room that we can take? I can see a hand up. Is there a roving microphone to pass? Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just to commend you all for a wonderful presentation. It's been clear that we grapple with the same issues when we deal with adjudication. Uh, I would just like to zero in on something from Charles's presentation. And the background is that um, in Zambia, we also don't have uh, a statute that deals with adjudication. So a question that I've had to deal with in the past couple of months from clients is, are you saying to me that So I just lost the sound. Yes. So the, the client will say, are you telling me that we will do adjudication? a lengthy process, we'll pay an adjudicator, get the decision, and then do arbitration, go through the lengthy process, pay arbitrators um, as well. The, the question I have for you is, would you agree with a proposition that says, then let's just scrap the adjudication and deal with um, arbitration, which in our context you will have um, an enforceable um, arbitral award that you can then um, take to court. Then the second one, if you may permit me, is uh, for Dr. Wilfred. You mentioned that um, the often the process, if I could say, degenerates in, into some kind of litigation when it's supposed to be quick. I mean, it's mirrored as arbitration. So. It's like you're doing it twice. Would you say this is because of um, the parties involved not following specific rules for um, adjudication or a lack of actual rules that um, clearly differentiate the process of adjudication from uh, an arbitration that comes after? Um, thank you. So let me take the first question and then I'll hand over to Dr. Wilfred. Uh, I think you've put your finger on a, on a very important issue and one that I've been grappling with uh, and I don't have a perfect answer, but let me, let me share my thoughts on that. Um, and I, I mentioned the stats from the DRBF as showing that dispute boards are, are overall successful. 
Uh, my, my impression is that that is very true of claims that or disputes that are simply not worth taking any further because of the amount at stake. Or put it the other way, if there is a lot of money at stake, one of the parties is bound, I think, to go and give it another shot, have another bite at the apple through the next step of dispute resolution, which is typically arbitration. And I, 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 last week, I just happened to be sitting in the same room as the general counsel of a, a big French contractor and the general counsel of a big German contractor. And I asked them the exact question that you raised. Is that I said, what do you think of these dispute boards? And their reaction, we're talking of people who, who only deal with you know, huge projects and therefore significant claims. And they had exactly the same reaction, that it's very trendy, but honestly, in our contracts, we would rather do without it because we're going to end up in arbitration anyway, number one. We pay these dispute board, these uh, dispute adjudication board members a lot of money from the start of the project. It's typically, and they were telling me that it's quite typical to pay a, just a retainer, the two days a month, a, a, a retainer, that's quite, uh, that's quite high, equivalent to two days of work. And then in addition to that, any actual work is, is paid. When you add it all up for a project that's going to last three or four years, we're talking hundreds of thousands of euros, dollars, or more. Um, so, so there you go. It's, it's not an answer to your question, but I think it's the uh, the picture is um, is uh, is not as clear as uh, as one would like it to be. Thank you very much. I'll take the second question, and it's a practical problem. And I want to say this: um, Who causes the question? Really, is uh, what is the cause of the parties? mimicking or bringing the tendencies of arbitration or litigation into adjudication and the dispute boards. You see, lawyers will only do what they know. Parties, I, I don't think the blame lies with the parties because many times uh, parties do not instruct their lawyers to come and become difficult or obstructive or to uh, bring that conduct. But there is that which they understand and again, if you look, I, I only mentioned one aspect, that the big problem in my own assessment is that the party representatives who represent parties in arbitrations and in litigation have found their way into adjudication and dispute boards. And that is a real problem. Again, arbitrators and people who have uh, litigation experience are also now sitting as adjudicators. And therefore, it becomes difficult for these people not to do what they ordinarily do elsewhere. The other problem is that even when you start reading decisions of adjudicators, they are more and more looking like judgments of courts. They are looking more and more like awards of arbitrators, complete with the case law and arguments and all that, and objections. And my colleague has said, you come on the first day of the adjudication, you have 28 days, you convene a meeting, the first meeting, and you are faced with a preliminary objection, applications, and you are asked to make decisions on them. And if you don't do that, you're convinced, convening people's constitutional rights to being heard and the rights to do certain things. And arguments will be made. Some of them very persuasive arguments. The, how, what do you do? What I do sometimes as an adjudicator is that I spend the first one hour actually trying to explain the principles of adjudication, trying to make these people unlearn the conduct of doing things in, in arbitration and in court. You may be successful, you may not be successful. But what my colleague said is important. The advocate or the representative that comes before you, the choice of a party representative is critical. Because if you have people who understand the process, they are most likely to align the same with the principles. Because remember, where we have non-statutory adjudication, you are defaulting to the general principles of adjudication and perhaps the rules which have been agreed upon by the parties. So the difficulties that come in adjudication, and I have always asked myself this question, it is very difficult as an advocate many times to, or as a lawyer, or as counsel, to 
explain to somebody that we are going to this process, most likely we are going to take 18 months, then go to another process, which is going to take us two years, and not cheap processes, as you've been told. Now, when you look at the totality of that, some people ask you a very uh, significant question. Do we really need this arbitration? Why don't we just go to arbitration directly without uh, going to adjudication? But again, with all its problems, fraud with all those problems, the process seems to be very popular among people who uh, resolve disputes in, uh, in, in infrastructure and construction disputes, particularly because of two reasons. One reason is the time, the time, the 28 days, the 80 days, the 90 days that is prescribed. And number two is the expertise. I think what really persuades people is the expert determination that comes in uh, adjudication. So it's a, it's a problem that needs uh, capacity building. It's a problem that requires. It's a problem also in arbitration. It's not just a problem in adjudication. Even arbitration today, more and more looks like litigation. You will not go through an arbitration of more than $10 million dispute without an application for some something, recusal, jurisdictional question. You will find all those things that happen in court in this space. How do we go forward? You need more people who understand this process. You may need the statutory process, but as I said, I don't think the answer entirely lies in having a formal statutory process. What needs to happen is you need more people who understand this process, including in the courts, because many lawyers default to court. But if they find that if you go to court, you will be told this is the dispute resolution place of choice, and this is how it happens. Many times, when lawyers are confronted with decisions from superior courts, supreme courts, which tell them that that process will be sanctioned by this court because that is how the process works, they are most likely to come before you and, 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 and go by the rules. However, if they find that they are able to find escape routes in court, you will have more problems within the process itself. So it's not a full proof process but it's a process fraught with its own challenges but that is what the parties really desired thank you very much for that Wilfred. um that that seems an absolute a very appropriate place for us to call a halt to proceedings this afternoon um we are at um a half past three i think we use up our, a lot of time um, just give me enough time just to say thank you to the panel, uh, to Michelle, Dr. Charles, Dr. Wilfred, and to David. Thank you very much for your contributions. They were excellent. And I hope that members of the audience, both online and in the room, um, enjoyed the session as much as I did. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Abdul, um, and thanks for sticking to time. Um, so at this point, and with plenty of thanks to every member of the panel, um, it's time for lunch, just the right time for lunch. Please, can we proceed to the next um, call and let's have lunch for one hour and then we'll be back here. <laughs>
Thank you.